I'm joined by Mark Brody from Los Angeles. He's the president of Panda Mountain and the U.S. China Environmental Fund. Great to see you again. Thank you so much. Mark, walk us through the process, uh, progress rather, in the panda population over the past 50 years, where it started and how it's going now. Thank you. Well, it's been a good 50 years. It, it had a rough start in the early 80s. Uh, there was tremendous concern about a bloom of uh, bamboo. Habitat was being lost through deforestation, and the panda's primary food, uh, the bamboo, had started flowering throughout Szechuan. So there was a rallying cry, and at that time, uh, both the Chinese scientists, international scientists, came together to work out new protocols, largely on panda breeding, that have proven tremendously successful. And uh, now we have a captive population much, much larger than one ever could have imagined. And there's been tremendous uh, progress, uh, significant changes in the number of giant panda protected areas. And most significantly, uh, there is now the new administration of a overarching giant panda national park that provides unified coordinated management for all giant panda protected areas. How significant was the beginning of the China-US panda diplomacy? It kind of helped kick off in, in one way conservation efforts, especially now there are many other countries taking part in this diplomacy. Oh, absolutely. I think both uh, the National Zoo in Washington, D.C., and the San Diego Zoo were instrumental in scientific breakthroughs on the veterinary science and animal husbandry, how to essentially help giant pandas uh, become uh, pregnant or deliver babies in captivity, and then equally important, how to provide for what is a terribly small animal. Uh, at their birth, uh, a giant panda is only four ounces, and it's the greatest differential between a the size of a mother and the size of a baby panda is about 900 times. So it's, it's very, very delicate when those pandas are first born. And, and both zoos were instrumental in helping China uh, improve uh, the care for captive pandas. And that being said, Mark, have other species benefited from the example set forth by panda con conservation? Have other organizations consulted with, with folks dealing with pandas? Oh, absolutely. So two parts to that question. Certainly, the pandas are called sometimes a keystone species. They're charismatic mega species. They're an umbrella species. So when one sets out to help pandas in the wild, uh, it's a comprehensive effort to essentially protect forests and improve forest ecosystems. So all animals living within that ecosystem benefit. And uh, most notably, there are some large cats, uh, great cat species. There are uh, golden monkeys talking, a kind of a uh, humorous cow, a wild cow. So there's a range of animals and a red panda as well. In terms of cooperation, I think beyond the zoos, international organizations, most noticeably uh, the World Wildlife Fund, WWF, and then universities throughout the globe, universities in China. Uh, there's all types of scientific collaboration around panda cooperation. And I think the new giant panda national park will significantly improve and enhance that uh, ability for organizations both within China and uh, internationally to contribute. All right. Well, cheers to another 50 years. Mark Brody, thank that you so much for joining Thanks. us.